So it's my pleasure now to introduce Nergis Mavalvala, um, who is our Air and Space Award recipient. Nergis is the Associate Head of the Department of Physics and the Curtis and Kathleen Marble Professor of Astrophysics at MIT. She's a physicist whose research focuses on the detection of gravitational waves from violent events in the cosmos that warp and ripple the fabric of space-time. She is part of the scientific team that in early 2016 announced the first direct detection of gravitational waves from colliding black holes using the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO detectors. This breakthrough ushers in a new era of astrophysics, allowing observations of the violent and warped universe not visible with light. In addition to her work on developing technologies for gravitational wave detectors since her graduate student years in the 1990s, Mavavala has conducted pioneering experiments in the optical trapping and cooling of mirrors to enable observation of quantum phenomena in macroscopic objects. She is the recipient of a 2010 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. She earned a BA in physics and astronomy from Wellesley College and a PhD in physics from MIT. So it's my great pleasure to welcome her up here. So hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. I'm actually really embarrassed by that bio, and I've, I've just had, you know, I have to kind of entertain you now after that snoozer of a bio. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a story, and my story is sort of titled uh, Opening a New Window into the Universe. And so to be able to tell you what the new window is, at first I have to tell you what the old window used to be. And the old window is light. And a light is the way we have, we as humans have looked out into the, into the sky forever from, from recorded history. Initially, we looked out into the sky because we thought that was the habitats of de deities and divine uh, uh, beings that could control our, you know, our fate here on, on the earth. Um, in the last millennium, it became clear that if we studied the stars, and starlight is what we, we used for that, it would help us with things like navigation. Um, in the very modern era uh, of astronomy and studying stars, we now understand that the real uh, compelling reason to study the universe is that that is the place in which our origins reside. The story of our origin, everything we're made of here on the Earth didn't come from the Earth, didn't come from the Sun, didn't even come from our solar system. It came from the stars out here locally and in the distant universe. So if we want to know what our history was and what our future is, we got to look out into the sky. And we've done that using starlight. And I'll show you the, a picture that I really like that, that uses all colors of light, even colors of light that our own human eyes can't see. And it's a very pretty picture that I like to show because it's actually a, a picture of a supernova. And a supernova is what happens when a star dies. A star like our own sun eventually will run out of uh, nuclear fuel that makes it shine. When it runs out of that, its own gravity causes it to implode on itself. And it kind of has this beautiful explosion. And all these different colors of light tell us about what happened to that star. And we care about this supernova because partly it's, it's going to be the, the story of our own sun, uh, but rest assured, five billion years from now, so we don't have to worry about it in the immediate future. But there's another thing that's incredible, which is that the life and death of stars is like the human life cycle or any other life cycle. Uh, Parent stars die to give birth to new uh, children stars. If you look in the very center of that picture, you'll see a little blue dot. See this guy here? Yeah. yeah, so that is a newborn star when this old star exploded. And that is not a star like our own sun. It's called a neutron star. It's made of neutrons. And that's one of the building blocks of matter and an important piece of our, our, our story today. Now, if this parent star that exploded happens to be called Cassiopeia A, it's in the constellation Cassiopeia, if this parent star before it exploded had been a lot heavier than it was, this one was about the mass of our own sun, but if it had been three, five, ten times the mass of our sun, which stars can do, this little neutron star would have continued to collapse, 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 till it would have turned into a black hole. 
Now, a black hole is a very mysterious object that is really not made of matter. Neutron stars are made of neutrons. Black holes are actually made of gravity, if you will. So if we wanted to observe these objects like neutron stars and black holes, and black hole in particular gives off no light, that's why it's called a black hole, then you have to use some other property. Now, why would we want to study black holes? Well, it turns out that if you don't include black holes in your menu of stars that are out in the universe, you can't construct the universe we see today. So they're a very important building block of the universe and where we are today. So it might be a good idea to see how many they are, what they do, how they live, how they die. But they don't give off light, and so we now need to turn to some other property of a black hole. And it turns out the black hole is black because it has so much gravity, so much mass, that it actually can't, even light can't escape. So the property we could use is gravity. And that's the new window into the universe. We are going to, I'm going to show you how over many decades and work of, of, of not just me, but really hundreds of other fellow scientists has led to uh, this, this new window opening. So that window starts by us understanding what gravity looks like. And that picture came to us from a, a, a very familiar scientist to, 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 to most of us in the room, and it was Albert Einstein. And about 100 years ago, Einstein told us that when you sit out in empty space, and this is remarkable, hold on to your seats, Empty space actually isn't just, doesn't just sit around. If you put a massive object like a star in empty space, it curves. It curves like a, putting a bowling ball in the center of a cushion. If you take that bowling ball or star and you move it around, empty space actually ripples. Oh, it actually makes these ripples. So now if you were, if you, we as, 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 as observers, so this is a pair of neutron stars, and these neutron stars are orbiting each other. And if we were observers far away, it would be like being, uh, if you dropped a rock on the center of a, a still pond, and if you're a boat a, dis a little distance away, as that ripple passes by, your boat would bob. And that's what these, w these ripples of space time would do to us here on the Earth from distant neutron stars far away. They would ever so slightly cause us to change our size and make us bob a little, stretch and shrink us. Now, it turns out, interestingly, as an aside, Einstein gave us this theory, a very successful theory by all the measures, except no one had ever seen this part of it, which was the wave. And he himself actually really disliked the idea and, and, and often in his career doubted if they existed. So we have now proof that they do, as, as you can guess I'm going to tell you. So let me tell you a little bit about this, the story. So in, what are these gravitational waves? In 1916, Einstein discovered them from his theory of gravity. Uh, as a theory, not, nothing observed. And he actually dismissed them as being too faint to ever be useful or detectable. And that's, that, was, that was his view of it. Now, fast forward you know, uh, uh, decades later, in the 1960s and 70s, this man, Kip Thorne, he told us, yep, yeah, they're pretty faint, but he actually, for the first time, put a number on how faint they would be. And this is a number that if you folks are not in, 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 uh, familiar with numbers like this, number. It's a, it's, a, it's a decimal point with 20 zeros and then a one. Okay? So it's small. But you know, it's still not a number that, that we can feel in our gut because it's just it's a number for what's the size of the wave. And what that means is it's really saying what's the size of the ripples of space-time that, that, that these neutron stars orbiting each other would, would make. Okay, now in the same era, another hero of our story and my, and, and my PhD advisor, Ray Weiss, um, oh, I don't know what happened here, um, actually came up uh, with the idea that gravitational waves should be detectable, but he set, you know, he threw down an incredible gauntlet in the, uh, in the late... We time. just have to figure out how we can measure changes in distance of 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now here I'm going to try and make you feel this in your guts. 10 to the minus 18 meters is a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of a single atom. A nucleus of a single atom is 10,000 times smaller than the atom itself. And the atom itself is about 10,000 times smaller than, say, a human hair that you could see. So I'm telling you that this is billions of times smaller than anything that we, in our experience, can touch or feel. And so Weiss had this idea that you could do it. Weiss and Korn met in 1975, and through their work, an experiment was born. This experiment's called LIGO. 
And this experiment was, I'm not going to go into all the details of how it worked, but it basically the idea was that if you shine laser beams at mirrors like that animation there shows, you can use the laser beam to measure the position of the mirrors, and if a gravitational wave comes through, the mirrors will move and you can measure that motion. That was the simple principle, and then we needed this huge apparatus. These, uh, these detectors in the same L shape as the cartoon are two and a half miles long. The, the two in the US are one in Louisiana and one in Washington State. And so that, that was the experiment that was born. It had lots of, of, of bells and whistles in there that I won't talk about. But I will say something that's very interesting and important about, about science uh, uh, at this scale. This uh, effort was funded by the National Science Foundation over four decades. Uh, and, and, and for the first 30 years of its operation, we did not have signal. Okay, so this, these were built in the 1990s. They were proposed in the 1970s. And we'll fast forward now to 2015 when we made our first uh, discoveries. Okay? But before I tell you what the discovery was, let me tell you what you should expect to see. So what I'm going to show you is a movie. And this movie is a pair of black holes. And what you are going to see is what does, do these black holes do to the space time around them, which is this, uh, this uh, 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 plane here. And what you'll see is when our own sun, when, our, when we, the Earth, orbit the sun, no time in our history are we going to orbit and crash into the sun. We're just going to close on the orbit. A year later, we're back where we were. A year later, we're back where we were. Neutron stars and black holes, when they orbit each other, they don't do that. They don't do that because they, because they're so gravitationally strong and relativistic, they are radiating these gravitational waves. Now, these waves, like any other wave, carries energy. So as this energy is carried out, it comes from the orbit, which means the two stars have to get closer and closer to each other and eventually collide. And when they do that, you get this incredible storm of ripples on the space-time. And that's what our signal will look like. That in the movie phase, you'll see the signal accumulating till they collide right here. And you'll see space-time going absolutely uh, uh, spectacularly warped. So let's play the movie. So here we go. There's the two black holes. Now what you'll see is that the colors are just a, a, a color mapping of Oh, okay, yeah, you know, I'm a mover. I, I should have gotten a lapel mic. Uh, all right, but you can see black holes, they're black, and these are the funnels of the, uh, uh, or the dents they make around their own space-time, but when they get close enough to each other after orbiting, and you'll see their space-time start to merge, you know, so ho all these two funnels will start to curve uh, together, and at the moment when the two black holes touch will be where we get the maximum in the signal, and that's when the space-time will be just, you know, this nice, quiescent, flat plateau will become a ridiculously warped mountain range. And that's the, the, the effect of these black holes uh, in, in their space-time, and these, uh, these magenta rings are the gravitational waves that travel outwards. So you can just think of this event as a pair of black holes when they collide is like essentially uh, my dropping, you know, two rocks on the surface of a pond, and then those ripples far away came to us. And now I'm going to tell you how uh, far away they came to us. And uh, uh, this is a, a, the work, uh, the, the movie I showed you is a really interesting story too. Part of why it's taken 100 years from the time Einstein told us about these to the time we could detect them was they are very, very faint. As you saw, we are making measurements of very small motions. But these solutions of actually even predicting what the wave should, should look like was very difficult. And these are done with using supercomputers just in the last 10 years. So it took 90 years from the time Einstein told us about it to even figure out what exactly it should look like. But now we've done that, and we've built the, the detectors that could do it. And on September 14, 2015, we recorded the first signals from gravitational waves from the universe. And that's what it looked like in the two LIGO detectors. LIGO Livingston is Louisiana. LIGO Hanford is Washington. And there are the bumps and wiggles of the space-time um, itself. And there's a few things that are really interesting to see about what the, is now sort of seen as the, you know, as one of the, the, the important discoveries of our time. On the vertical axis is the amplitude of the wave. And remember, Kip Thorne told us in 1967 that it should be about 10 to the minus 21. Notice at the point when these two black holes collide, we get an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. So big check mark for Kip, <laughs> right? Good. 
Now, the other thing is if you ask when this measurement was made, how much were the mirrors of LIGO moving, which was, you see that they were moving by about 10 to the minus 18 meters. So big check mark for, for, for Ray. And in fact, that was recognized. They received the, uh, the, the physics Nobel Prize last year. So, so this is, you know, this is uh, uh, sort of the uh, um, now part of, I would say, scientific legend. OK, now you would think that uh, since this first detection, these detectors have detected uh, other um, uh, more black hole collisions. And I'm not going to tell you a great deal about them, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we can, from the bumps and wiggles that, he, that we see here, encoded in that signal, we can tell how heavy the black holes were, we can tell how far away they were, and we can tell how fast they were going. And so uh, without boring you with the details, I'll tell you these were very heavy. They were 30 times the mass of our sun. They were go at the time that they collided, they were traveling at half the speed of light. So now, look, even if you're not a scientist and you never think about these things, you should pause for a moment at, at, to see what nature is doing. Nature took something that's 30 times heavier than our sun, and it sped it up to the speed of light. And, you know, and the energy it takes to do that is, is, is Tremendous, and so, so uh, now one of the things that we also learned was that this system of black holes was over a billion light years away. So that gravitational wave traveled for a billion years before it came to our detector here on on, on the Earth. And you know, having listened to all the wonderful stories that the women uh, have told this morning, I'm a little bit envious because I don't get to go to my site and actually, you know, actually, you know, touch my objects. But uh, but I get to build instruments, which is pretty fun too. So that's the that's the story of these black holes. Now I want to return. So the black holes are kind of an interesting object because there's. They don't give off light, and this is the only way we could have seen it. If we pointed telescopes at this object, we would have seen We're now able to do that. Now, a couple of years later, we actually recorded the same kind of event, but the collision of two neutron stars. Now, neutron stars are not black holes. They're made of neutrons, and when they collide, it's like taking two atoms and uh, an atomic nuclei and smashing them together. So you get this spectacular light show. And in addition to the light show, you also can make new elements, new atoms. So I'll show you a movie. It's purely a movie. It's very fun to show you that we had two neutron stars that were orbiting each other. They were giving off gravitational waves, which LIGO saw. And then shortly after that, there's an explosion which was seen by all the light telescopes in, 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 in the world. So, uh, so here is the movie. Two neutron stars. I apologize for the music, but it, I, it'll wake you up. So, so neutron stars, they're giving off these gravitational waves. And notice as they get close to each other, they'll kind of tidally disrupt and deform. And now you get this enormous jet of light. Enormous light pours out. And then in this cloud of stuff that we see is new elements are being born. And let me tell you why I, I, I think this is one, one of the, you know, a second of the spectacular discoveries of our time. For the longest time, we have had a mystery for decades. We've had a mystery here on the Earth. Where do heavy elements like gold and platinum come from? We know that the lighter elements are fused in the sun. So from the sun, we can get hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, things we're made of. But when you get to these rare, heavier elements, they're not fused in the sun. The sun doesn't have enough neutrons to do that. We think some of them come from those supernovae explosions I showed you in the beginning. Again, that accounts for a tiny fraction of it. So we have not known where gold and platinum comes from. And then from the observations of the light and the gravitational waves that we saw from this neutron star collision, we saw nature fusing gold and platinum in the abundances that we would expect uh, here on the Earth. So we have discovered nature's gold mine, if you will. And so that's the kind, of, that's the story I wanted to tell you. What, you know, what was the big deal about these discoveries? Why should you be excited? I'm going to end with sort of telling you that these discoveries are just a moment in time. What I think this, you know, what you're witnessing is going to last longer than I know. Let me tell you why I think that. We believe Galileo was the first the first person to point a telescope at the sky. And I told you humans for millennia have been looking at starlight. But he was the first to tell us. No one really remembers what he saw. But the fact that he put, pointed a telescope at the, tie, the sky was a paradigm shift. For the first time, he said, humans, we don't have to use our naked eye. We can use instruments. And when you use instruments, you can see more, farther, deeper. 
And from that time, we have built from this, his little one and a half inch telescope. By the way, toy store telescopes are better than that, that today. We've built 100 inch telescopes we've been in, on the Earth. We've built 100 inch telescopes in space. We are now building a 25, 30 meter class telescope. We've also added all the different colors of light, like infrared and x ray and radio waves that we are, our own eyes couldn't see. And from that, we have constructed this picture of the universe. But this was like going to a silent movie. We only could see. We had no other information that doesn't come from light. And now what we have done with these gravitational wave observatories is we've turned on, if you will, silent movies got their sound. We've turned on a new sense in which we, with which we can observe the universe. And I believe that just like with Galileo, in 100 years from now, people won't remember that LIGO saw the first black hole or the first neutron stars. People will be thinking about what are the next big telescopes we can build and what are the newest discoveries we can make. So I'm going to leave you with that thought, that you're, you're sitting at the cusp of sort of a, a, a scientific revolution rather than just some exciting discovery. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one quick question. Yes, Hillary. Hi, that was great. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, at work with your group, of, oh, with, with, with your own group? Yeah, sure. So look, um, I've spent my entire career since I was a, a graduate student in Ray Weiss's group of building the observatories. I'm a builder. And the problem that I've been working on, on now is, is, is that really esoteric part of my, my horrible bio which is I'm asking this question of how can we make the LIGO detectors better? And one of the things that we do is, you know, there's an L in LIGO and the L stands for laser. And so what we do, what's the role of the laser is the light beam. And you know, laser light, as all waves, has, a, has, has peaks and troughs. And we use the distances between those peaks and troughs, or the wavelength, as the tick marks on our ruler to measure where the mirrors are. And so, but it turns out lasers, like everything else, jitters, the tick marks jitter. So it'd be like asking you, please measure the, the size of this piece of paper, but I give you a ruler whose tick marks jitter, and every time you measure, you get a different measurement. So my work has been to try to reduce the jitter on, 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 on the tick marks of the laser, which is kind of fundamental. It comes to us from this, this, this quantum, from quantum mechanics, so it's a little hard to do, but we're, we're making progress. So that's what I do. I'm sorry for boring everyone else, but yes. <laughs> Okay, thanks.